I am delighted to welcome to the first time facilitator podcast, Jonas Rianto, uh, who is in Finland. Welcome to the show, Jonas. Thank you, Leanne. Nice to be here. Bit of context on this one. It's great to have you here. Uh, we booked this interview about a month ago. Now, in the last, I think it's been about seven days, Jonas has turned into the most popular man in Finland, if not the world, <laughs> because he's also known as the remote meeting guy. Um, can you just like, so first of all, we'll get a bit of background on your career history. Then I really want to talk to you about how your last sort of couple of weeks have been. So tell us, how did you find what you do today? Or what were the career pivots that led you down this path? All right. Um, so there's always been two themes in my life. One has been technology. And then a theme that emerged later in my life was people. Um, so I'm going to tell you a, a short story about uh, like the, the, the phases in my life that led up to this point. It all started uh, with, uh, like, I got introduced to technology in 1989. I was six years old. Uh, my dad was an IT manager. Um, he worked, uh, like, I was at his workplace uh, during the weekends. He worked a lot. Uh, and then I played around with a Unix terminal. So one of those dumb terminals uh, with those really loud, clunky keyboards. Uh, and, and just a, a monochrome screen, just green and black. And what I did was I was drawing with asterisks in a word processing program. I was drawing cars and uh, trees. And that's how it all began. And then I saw a TV ad when I was eight, um, a TV ad about Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega game console. I was like, what? What is this? I, I have to have this. And I, I wish that for my birthday. I got it, it was the best day of my life. And for the next several years, all I cared about was video games. Like it so completely immersed me. Um, and, and yeah, it just, it took my imagination away. And for several years, all I thought I was, how could I get my hands on all the video games in the world? And at the time, it seemed humanly possible to get your hands on all the video yeah. games in the world. <laughs> Not anymore, uh, but yeah, that was my life. and and. I remember my, my teenage years as being the nerd or the geek or, or whatever uh, other, like it was a derogatory term in the 90s to be a nerd. And now it's kind of a, oh, you're a nerd. Wow, uh, you're probably cool. Um, but yeah, those were the days. Um, and, and I was really socially awkward back then, like really. Um, I was bullied a lot because I just didn't share humor with others. I didn't understand what they were laughing at and they had never understood what I was laughing at. Uh, I felt like I was a lot in my just own imaginary world. I was interested in completely different things than my peers. I got along with adults, but not with my peers. Mm. And it was, wasn't until my 20s that I started to uh, realize that I can do something about this social awkwardness. Um, in fact, it changed quite a lot when I went to the States. That's why I don't sound like a Finnish person when I'm speaking English. I sound more like an American because I spent a year in Texas. Well, Very I lost cool. the Texan twang pretty quickly, uh, but I still have the American accent uh, left from that. But when I was in exchange, people started paying attention to me in a way like never before. I was like, so this is what it feels like to be a popular person. And it started to change my perspective of myself as well. Um, and so I got interested in personal development. Uh, I participated in, in theater uh, in, in school and um, I got a sales job. I worked for three years part-time as a sales clerk selling home electronics. And uh, slowly I started to become more and more interested in people. Like I, I got interested in psychology, linguistics. I've always been a language geek as well. Um, uh, I grew up with uh, three languages, Finnish, Swedish, and English. And then in school, I started learning German and French. And then I've learned some Spanish and I don't know uh, where, where I'm going to end up. <laughs> I just know Australian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I love Australian. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, but, so yeah, I was selling electronics and I started to to become more and more interested in customer service and what makes a good experience. Uh, I already had quite a few years of experience as, uh, as tech support. Obviously, people came to me for all kinds of problems with computers and later also smartphones. Um, so I always had this kind of service mentality. Okay, so 
then I got my first real IT job in the IT service sector. Um, I, I was almost uh, had almost graduated as an engineer, IT engineer. So that was my training. But then everyone knew me as the engineer who can speak human. So I was the guy in the company who could actually speak to people and, and engage with them. Uh, and so that was my identity for some time. I was like, yeah, I'm a proud geek who can speak to people. Uh, and I fell in love with uh, documentation at the time. I was a system ad, uh, administrator for a documentation um, uh, system. And uh, I trained people how to use it. And I developed all sorts of practices. I got interested in, in organizational development as well. Um, I did lots of training. Then uh, I felt like it stagnated. So uh, I took a year off, uh, traveled the world. And one of those legs on that um, trip was uh, Australia. So I was in, uh, I took it with my, uh, with my wife, we, uh, 10 months total, three years in Australia. We stopped, uh, flew into Sydney, went to Melbourne. From there we flew to um, uh, Cairns, as they Cairns, say over yes. there. Right up north. Uh, yes. <laughs> Had to practice that for a while. It's not Cairns or anything like that, it's Cairns. Cairns. <laughs> Love it. And then we, uh, we bought a used car, um, drove it down to Brisbane, uh, spent, I think, a week there, then flew to uh, New Zealand, uh, and it goes on. Mm. But uh, I really loved uh, the culture over there. Uh, I think uh, I related even more to the New Zealanders, mm. to the Kiwis, because uh, they're even more spread apart. Like Finns and, and, and Kiwis, we have about the same size country we're about as far apart from each other mm. and we like solitude. <laughs> Australians were more outgoing uh, to, to my, uh, Interesting. yeah, in my experience, yeah. but uh, I loved it. Uh, uh, it's, it's so nice to follow the podcast. Uh, I, I love your accent. I love oh, it. Thank you. I've actually had a few <laughs> listeners. I put out surveys, you know, why do you listen? Like, I like your accent. It's like, Oh, thanks. There's like, there's like hundreds of other, thousands of other Australian podcasts, but thanks for, Tuning into this one for the accent. <laughs> so can you share with listeners, what do you do now and why are you so in demand in this moment? All right. Um, so the biggest pivot was really uh, a, few, a few years after that. I did some more marketing, consulting, and then I stumbled onto this company, Great People. Uh, small company, uh, purely focused on facilitation. And I was like, uh, a friend... Uh, gave me a tip, said, uh, hey, this company is looking for a virtual facilitator. My first question was, a, a virtual what? Okay, let me Google facilitation. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this, this seems interesting. Um, and and I, I had a coffee with the CEO. We were supposed to meet for an hour. It lasted for an hour and a half at least. And I was like, I need to, to, to get to know these people. Uh, so people experts, wow. What, what would it be like to work with people who are people experts instead of computer experts? And suddenly my identity just had a, a huge shock. I had been used to being uh, the geek who can speak people. And now suddenly I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I'm now the engineer. Uh, I, I'm the, the people consultant who can speak computer. And, and everything was flipped around. And, and my identity was in question for a long time. I was like, who am I now? What is this? But I, after some time, I've realized that it's a great fit. I can use all of the skills I've acquired up to this point. Um, so all of that computer background means that I feel at home with mm -hmm. tech. It doesn't matter what platform we're using. I play around with it for a few minutes and then I'm like, all right, this is how it works. Um, and then I help others get over the anxiety that technology usually produces so we can talk about the real stuff. Why are we here? What are we trying to do? So I th think that's always been my skill that I help people get over that first threshold. Of, mm. uh, I can't focus on anything because this computer is in my way. I'd like to turn that, that around so that people think I can do amazing things thanks to this computer. Yes. Uh 
if you're listening, you won't see what Jonas just did with his hands, but um, I often see people that are battling with technology. They sort of just fumble around and get really frustrated. You can see their stress levels rise and then they just call IT and it's all too much. Um, that happens in Australia as well, as I'm sure it does around the world. Just quickly going back to your story. I think we were born mm -hmm. in the same year. So I was born in 1983. You were the same? Same year. Yep. Because <laughs> I remember this, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and having the Game Gear and I just played it. Oh, yeah. My favorite. Um, I was lucky my brother was a computer engineer. So we, I sort of grew up doing a bit of coding as well, making my first website when I was about 11. Um, right. Not to the extent that you're, that, that the path that you're on in terms of your skills. Now, things have turned in the last couple of weeks for you and everyone in Finland yeah. is working from home. Um, what are they calling you about? What question, what are the most sort of common questions that you're getting uh, at this point of time? Well, uh, I think people are really like, I can now see how many people were still not anywhere close to this remote working. Like I've lived in a bubble where remote working is a norm. I lived in a bubble where people are familiar with tech. Well, obviously I've started to come out of that bubble as I work with a lot of corporate groups where people have always just done the bare minimum regarding technology. So they, they learn as much as they need to, to survive in their jobs but they never go beyond. They never try to learn something. Uh, like, there's a subset of people who work in offices who, who are curious and, and, and like to explore, uh, but most people just try to get by and that means learning the minimum so that I can do my job, but they're always one step behind, mm -hmm. right? Because technology mm -hmm. evolves so fast. And now I can see all of the people who never tried anything and they're like, oh my God, what do I do now? Uh, I'm a therapist or I'm a teacher or I'm a, I'm a yoga instructor and I have to do everything remotely or a dance instructor. How do I make this work? Uh, how do I get people to, to interact, come online? Uh, how do I survive with the technology? Like what devices do I even need? Do I need he headphones? Uh, and like, so mm -hmm. they have a million questions related to, to everything from, uh, you know, what kind of computer will I need to which, uh, which meeting software should I use to, how do I run uh, a 200 person workshop? <laughs> all of the questions at once. So do it's you crazy. have a, have you created like a Google doc of all your frequently asked questions? You know what? I tried to start a project like that a few years ago uh, because I realized that by now I have helped thousands of people, friends, relatives, friends of relatives, um, colleagues, clients. There, there were so many people I had helped and I had, answers to so many questions and I, I noticed that people the digital divide was just growing so the the things that you can do with tech the things that are required so you can participate in society and people's skills were completely out of alignment and I thought there's no national service that gives information in, in Finnish about digital technology like where do you start what can you even learn what should you learn first mm -hmm. and I started to compile uh, my knowledge into these blog posts and, and organize everything. And soon I was like, I should probably write a book about this, or maybe I should do a website that has like articles and videos and, or maybe this could be an academy, like a virtual academy where people can learn and then teach each other. And, and I became obsessed with the idea for about a year. I, I was pretty close to, to turning it into some sort of company. I didn't really know what the financing was going to like, how was I going to make money off it? I had no idea. And that's when I ran into great people and I just shelved the idea. Got it. But so basically I have, I don't know how many hundreds of pages of material from various stages in my life that I could compile into a book or a website. Uh, for now, I'm content with uh, doing these trainings. I'm learning a huge amount about uh, group psychology um, and I think, and, and leadership for sure, which mm. is what I'm most interested in right now. Um, so we'll see what it turns into, might turn into anything in the next 10 yeah, years. Yeah, absolutely. When it evolves, with, particularly when you're learning all these sort of people skills and you're adding that to the technical stuff that you'd acquired. The reason I asked that was um, there was a LinkedIn post the other week. I was talking to someone about Microsoft Teams on LinkedIn. And then mm -hmm. you notice you chime in and you're just so good because I, I struggle sometimes with Teams and like I'm Team Zoom. I love Zoom. I find Microsoft Teams just too clunky and annoying to get permission if you're an external provider. And the right. amount of 
information that you wrote on there. I was absolutely astounded. So I was just thinking, I hope this guy like didn't just write this from scratch and he's got some kind of tool that he's cutting and pasting from, but, um, uh, it's unbelievable, well, really. I think those, most of those conversations just come out of, uh, so much experience. I, I find that my approach to learning tech is, is what, is pretty rare it's not unique but it's rare mm -hmm. uh, some people uh, are like me so they they find a new piece of software or a new service and the first thing they do is they click through every single menu so they they, they map it out what is this made of mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a Finnish saying uh, what has it eaten um, to, to find out what kind of animal it is. What has it eaten? And that's the first thing. What, what is this eaten? Uh, so I, I'm trying to find out what is it supposed to do? Who is it for? What are the limitations? How has it been designed? And, and then I take something away from it. I realize, okay, this tool is built for this. It might be useful for this. And I categorize everything in my mind just by, by, by learning how, and it's like I have, I have this association that, okay, you need a simple mind mapping tool this is the right one. Um, you need to, to do uh, group work with the simplest possible tool, Google Docs. Uh, so all these associations come up and when a person asks any question, I usually don't have ready material in written form. Yeah. I just like, hmm, hey, I know. And then by typing it out, I'm learning myself. Yes. I noticed that um, uh, uh, Juanda, who, who you've uh, interviewed before mm -hmm. uh, has a some a similar process. I sense that he does this too. He he writes these long posts. It's his learning process. That right? is really interesting. By contributing to the group, you're actually refining your thought process. Yeah, I'm learning as I type. <laughs> yeah, I love because like because you guys are in different time zones. So I wake up in the morning and it's like the Jays have just been like dueling on or just like <laughs> commenting, 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 and I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot keep up. <laughs> I think he's yeah. an engineer as well, actually. Mm. Yeah, I love that. That's so good. Thank you so much for coming crossing over to the bright side, to the people mm -hmm. side. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I guess the common question we often get is, um, and I ran a couple of webinars today and getting that engagement in webinars, there's a lot that's going on in someone's head, you know, getting on video and how they might not be comfortable with that, contributing when it's right. like one person at a time. As a facilitator, someone that goes virtual quite often, how do you get that trust when it comes to these workshops that are online and you don't have the luxury of, of getting that face-to-face -face interaction? All right, let me see my notes. I wrote some things down because I was like, hmm, I wonder how I actually do that. Um, so I think the key thing is that people uh, need to be seen. Uh, they want to be seen and they, they need to feel like uh, when I'm seen, I can trust others, right? So how to make them visible? That's the, the problem in remote sessions. Uh, when we're in the same room, all we need to do is clear the tables and put people in a circle. Problem solved. People can see each other. Um, after a few moments with some uh, good uh, icebreakers, people start to feel like I'm seen and respected by others. My voice, uh, people want to hear what I have to say. It's a lot harder to create that remotely, or at least we don't have the same mechanisms. So we have to kind of engineer the, the trust. I think in a sense, that's what facilitators do anyway. The process is mm -hmm. social engineering. We're creating the structure for people to feel safe and be themselves and so that they can lean into the work and, and forget themselves for a moment uh, and just discover something together. I think it's beautiful, but it's really hard to do remotely. So what can we help with? The same thing, um, use icebreakers, but the icebreakers look and feel quite different. Um, get them to talk about any topic that's beside uh, the working topic for the day. Um, one of my favorite starting methods is picture cards. I've shared this on the uh, flip chart group as well, an image of uh, picture cards. So I put on one slide, let's say 10 or 12 images that just randomly chosen off the internet. And then I number them from one to 10, one to 12. Uh, the instructions are um, choose the picture that X, and then you can ah, complete this with choose good. the picture that tells how your day began, how your day has gone so far, how your last weekend was, how you feel about this upcoming project. 
right? So good. Uh, and so good. then you just uh, you start with yourself and, and say, okay, I will choose a picture seven today. And that's because, well, I, I feel a bit nervous, but excited at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm appearing on this podcast and I really like it, <laughs> you know? And then you share your, your emotional state. Uh, you become visible to the others. And now the others have an example. How long should I speak? On what emotional level? I mean, this is the same thing as face-to-face, -face, but it's even more important when we don't have real eye contact, uh, when, when we can't read body language uh, very well. Mm. So uh, hearing people's tone of voice and what kind of story they tell is extremely important. But I usually tell a 20-second story, and then I ask uh, a few people to say, okay, John, you picked number three. Uh, can you tell me why you picked that picture? Okay, so you're really directing the conversation as well. So looking at chat and going, okay, John, number three. So instead of like leaving it hanging, like who wants to go next, you're saying. Yeah, and hey, I feel that's very necessary. Mm. So any uncertainty is going to reduce my uh, participation. I'm going to be more passive the more uncertain I am. So in the beginning, I try to reduce uncertainty in all the ways that I can. Mm. I, I've maybe done a, a systems check in advance, like a separate session where we just sign into the meeting, try out the tech, and, and whatever tools I want the participants to use during my session, we try them out, and then they have a chance to ask questions, and then once we uh, are about to start our session on the day, they're a lot more confident and relaxed. So I try to do that in advance, and then uh, the icebreaker, um, I try to keep it simple and keep it straight, so I, I don't and the larger the group, the harder this is. If you have mm. 10 people in the call and you say, okay, who wants to go first? Four people are going to speak at the same time if they're American. And then you have 15 seconds of silence if they're Finnish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so either way, it's not working very, very well. And one way to solve that is just to, to uh, address specific people uh, and, and that's really scary if you're the first one to go, right? Mm. You're putting people on the spot. But if you start with yourself, you've already given them an example. They're not the first one to go anymore. So that's why I share first. Then I ask a few people. If it's a large group, maybe I'll ask four or five people. If it's, uh, if it's Zoom that I'm using and it's really easy and quick to do a breakout session, I'll use that, uh, that moment to do a breakout session and just tell them, all right, um, now that you've chosen a picture, um, and, and thought of your, your story, uh, I'll send you into breakout rooms. Um, we'll do a short peer discussion, three minutes, just share your story of how your day began. And, and we'll get back here in a moment. I'll start the breakout session now, click. That is so good. I can tell that you've done that before. That instruction was delivered really well. <laughs> Very much more <laughs> <few> <laughs> than, uh, than my one this morning, <laughs> experimenting with breakout rooms. Um, awesome. So with interaction, and it's great that you use Zoom. I love Zoom as well. It seems like everyone's looking for something else, but it seems like it's industry standard and the one that's sort of most reliable. We're recording this over Zoom, this podcast interview. Mm -hmm. So that's your icebreaker. Important to get people feeling certain. Uh, I love the way that you demonstrate that by sharing your story. How about say if you've got like an, a one hour workshop that you're facilitating virtually, how do you piece through interaction through that? Do you have a sort of set time thing? Do you say, right, every 10 minutes, I'm going to throw in something interactive or how do you design the interaction into your workshops? Um, okay. So here's a, uh, an interesting tidbit. Up until a week ago, um, virtual workshops were very, very rarely on the table. People weren't really looking to do workshops um, because it was so far from what they could imagine that it could be done remotely. So people were looking for remote meeting uh, skills training or remote leadership training if they were managers. Um, I, I would say that maybe no more than 5% of everyone I trained was interested in actually doing virtual workshops. Mm -hmm. And also because we're a small company um, and, and I was doing virtual all by myself, everyone else was doing face-to-face. -face. That's all changed now, of course. Um, but no one else was really interested in getting into, like deeply into virtual facilitation. Mm -hmm. Everyone was like, no, I, I like the face-to-face -face interaction. <laughs> Yep, me here. Yep. Uh, I'll put my hand up for that. <laughs> I, and I love it quickly. too. The truth is, I love it too. Um, if, if I could decide freely how to work, I would probably work 50% face-to-face and 50% virtually. Mm. 
Um, but, but because of the, like I was specialized, right? Um, but so we didn't have plenty of resources to, to market virtual workshops. So I haven't done very many. Uh, I can speak more from a reference point of, we always have a workshop style training session. So uh, I'm training remote meeting skills. Um, we usually try to get people for a bit longer than an hour because an hour's time, you need to get over the tech. You need to get over your, your uh, nervousness with uh, being online with a group of people in an interactive session. Uh, you need to become comfortable with the, the controls of everything. Uh, and then we can start talking about the topic. So we usually like to reserve two and a half hours. That's long enough that we have plenty of time. We can have a break in between. Uh, maybe we can do an energizer. We can try out different tools. We can discuss what does this mean for your work? We can have those discussions. Um, and it's not so long uh, that we can have it like before lunch or after lunch as a half day session pretty easily. Last one. Um, mm. How do we then build in interaction? Um, the first 15 minutes is an interactive start. So we do the sound check. You know, I ask everyone to say hello, write something in the chat. If there's a whiteboard, maybe ask people to draw something on the whiteboard. Then there's the, uh, you know, the start, purpose, uh, agenda, way of working. And then we do the icebreaker. Um, after that, I try to have maybe 10 minutes of uh, speaking, uh, slides, lecture, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And then some short exercise like um, what were the key insights for you from the last section? Mm -hmm. um, the options are write in your own notes and then we'll do a breakout session. Uh, write in the chat or Okay, so the options are uh, write in the chat or uh, write in your personal notes and then we'll do a breakout session or uh, we'll all start writing immediately on a whiteboard, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, often the interaction just means let's try this tool. Um, like people have thought about something personally for three minutes, written down something on paper, and then uh, I, I open a whiteboard and then I, I ask, all right, um, Let's have a few people uh, just tell me what, what you wrote down. What about George? And then I, I write things down on the whiteboard as they, as they speak. Uh, and then I ask the next person. Uh, I would use this in a pretty small group, let's say six mm -hmm. or seven people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then once three or four people have spoken, then I will actually open the, the floor for anyone to speak. So uh, what would you like to add to the conversation? What hasn't yet been said? <clears throat> it's a lot easier to participate in that uh, once the you you you've, you've written down even at least something. Mm. Anything. Yeah, it's not it's not right? a blank slate. It's hard to participate. Mm. Yeah, on a blank slate. Uh, but then when there's something, it's easier to participate. So mm. I ask a few people to go first uh, after they've had some time to think about for themselves. It's really clever. I think what you're saying is just a clever adjustment of what we'd do in a face-to-face -face workshop, but it's being a bit more, I think the language about that, the instructional delivery is really important. I think that's the difference. But I think for anyone, yeah. including myself, trying to pivot what we do face-to-face -to, -face to an online environment, what I'm figuring out that's most important very quickly is how we give those instructions and how specific we really are. And also knowing what the options are available to us before we go into and hop onto a Zoom chat and just go, right, share in the, because this morning I was like, okay, just share in the chat. Every time it was the chat, but I didn't think of ideas like the whiteboard or even just being tactile and using your own notepad. So I think, right. you know, yeah. it's, it's just, yeah. um, you're opening up, up some really great ways, really practical ideas for all of us. So thank you so much. In terms of um, tools, we could go on about that. This is like a whole other podcast episode, but do you have like, what are your favorite, the most essential when people are calling you around Finland going, we need to go online. We need to go virtual. What kind of things are you recommending to them in terms of tech and the tools they can use? Okay. So here's another um, feature about the way that, that I do my, my work uh, because we mostly train uh, corporate groups and then in the public sector, they're usually larger organizations. And people don't usually get to choose the tools um, that they use. They, they have set tool. I, I, I think this is actually changing now. Uh, we're in a, in a situation where people have to adopt new tools no matter what the rules are. Mm -hmm. But up until a week ago, <laughs> the rules were in most organizations, um, use the tools the organization provides. 
So either they were in the Microsoft ecosystem, and that means they had Teams, Word, Excel, OneNote, and a bunch of other tools, or they were in the Google ecosystem, and that they had all the Google Docs uh, and Hangouts, um, or maybe they were using uh, Zoom, and then I would ask, all right, so what can we use with Zoom? Do you have Microsoft apps, Google apps? What do you use? For instance, um, maybe you've heard of Confluence, or maybe not. No, Does it say anything? Okay, that's um, it's an Australian product from Sydney. Atlassian oh, produces Atlassian. a huge yeah. range of software products. Confluence is their documentation software, the one that I administrated for three years in one of my previous jobs. Absolutely love it. It is highly interactive. That's why it was so fascinating to see how documentation can actually live through the comments that people put into it. Uh, that's Confluence was how I discovered what live documents are like. It was amazing. Wow. Anyway, uh, Confluence was uh, one of our clients had Zoom and Confluence. And I was like, all right, I can build a workshop on top of Confluence. Uh, 12 concurrent editors is the maximum. But let's just divide the group into um, the, the whole group into groups of 12. So 12 people per session. And then we'll see how it works when we collaborate in real time on uh, Confluence pages. So I don't usually get to choose the tools. The client chooses mm. the tools. If I don't know them already, I learn how to use them. And then I build a process on top of that. And then I teach that process to the participants. And any favorites? Because you've been you've well, such exposure to all of them. Yeah. If you, yeah. All right. Uh, favorites would be um, Zoom is my favorite because it's so feature complete when it comes to uh, facilitating groups. The, the breakout rooms feature is mm. a killer feature. Also, there's so much control. Uh, I really love Zoom in that sense. Um, Teams is evolving and becoming better all the time. And I think Teams is, it really shines uh, in large organizations or in projects. So if I'm working with a large organization and people are comfortable working in Office 365, I really enjoy working with Teams. Uh, and, and once the Microsoft whiteboard evolves to the point where it works on all devices uh, and it works across organizations, that's gonna be my favorite visualization tool. Microsoft whiteboard is very, very promising. It's gonna be free for anyone who uses Office 365. That's why it's so compelling. There's no barrier to entry, uh, Yeah, like, we usually talk to HR. Those are the ones who buy training. And then there's like, all right, so uh, can we use this tool? Hmm, I'm not sure. We'll have to talk to IT. Okay, let's forget about that. Let's not go <laughs> yes. talk to IT, because I know that's where the conversation is going to end. IT is going to say no anyway. Yeah. That's usually the story. Mm. Um, but yeah, okay, so Microsoft Whiteboard is one of my favorites. Um, Mural. Uh, is very, very promising. I haven't had a chance to use it a lot, but it seems like they are really, really into this uh, visual digital facilitation thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Miro is another one that's uh, very, very good. I've used that a bit more than Mural, but I'm, I'm starting to think that Mural is maybe better for our, for our clients. So those are my really, my favorite apps because they're so versatile. And there's a Finnish one that I have to mention, which I think is, uh, deserves special mention is Howspace. Okay. Um, it's been around for a few years and it's um, designed for digital facilitation. It's basically a website that you can throw together in a few minutes. It's built out of modules so you can have chat, you can have um, wow. voting, you can have um, brainstorming, there's word clouds. They, they've thrown together all sorts of different facilitation tools into one big platform uh, and you don't even need an account to sign in. Everyone oh gets gosh. a personal link into their email. They click it. There's no password. Let's start working. That's awesome. I'll have so to check it out. So it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll put a link to all of those um, tools that you mentioned in the show notes. So listeners can have a click around and experiment while they're learning on the go, as am I. Now I've had, awesome. I think this is my seventh hour of Zoom calls today. This is really unusual. <laughs> okay. And maybe you're used to it. I'm certainly not. How do you, my friend Steph, um, we recorded a quick podcast today just talking about the COVID situation and she's like, oh, I think I'm, I've got a sore throat, but I, I don't think it's that. I think I've got Zoomitis, like just been talking so much on <laughs> Zoom. I thought that is such a cool phrase. Love it. Oh, yes. So how do you yes. maintain your energy when you are 
just on these calls, I feel like I've got to dial up the energy more than I would in real life. Oh yeah, I can relate to that. Um, so the situation has escalated for me as well. I mean, I wasn't in calls all the time before COVID. It, like, I would say that I, I was in training or in meetings no more than 15 hours a week. Uh, and the rest of the time was developing, marketing, uh, planning, preparing, documenting. So there was all these, uh, this auxiliary work uh, that's, the, that's needed. Uh, and and I, I have auxiliary roles at our company. Um, I have a small company. I'm also our IT manager. Uh, and I do some of our marketing. So awesome. that's a I cool had a full-time job before this. <laughs> and now I have two yeah. full-time jobs or, or something like that. Uh, we're, we're getting it under control uh, slowly, but this is new for me as well. I haven't been on calls this much, mm. uh, but the way that I see it is you, it's harder to communicate your energy when you don't have body language and you need to give people energy when they're trying to learn anything new. And I see workshops the same way as training is for learning something new. I have to shift something in my head. Uh, I have to learn how to do things in a new way. I have to think in new ways. I have to come up with new concepts. Uh, there's a lot of pressure. And so people need energy. And if you can't communicate it with your body language, how can you? Uh, the voice is really the only thing that we have. Um, you can do something with the design, like building in that interaction, making it a bit fun and light, uh, you know, dropping an energizer somewhere. You know, you can, you can do eye exercise. Uh, and there's this great uh, finish like cartoon artist that this, it was this frog uh, and it was in a, in a, in a local accent. So it, if you read it in Finnish, it sounds funny just reading it out loud because it's in a wacky accent. And then there's the frog doing things like um, uh, there's a fly going um, from, from the top right corner into the top uh, bottom left corner of your vision. And then you have to move your eyes according to the instructions. And it's, just, <laughs> it's to prevent eye fatigue, but I thought it was a superb energizer oh, for any virtual wow. session. Wow, I love that. Is it, um, I'll have to, I'll Google it, but if you can send the link through, that sounds really sure. fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. I think maybe it's because I am doing a lot with my face, like trying to really, because trying to put all my body language into just what's above my just neck. Just the face. And perhaps uh, your hands. You can do something with oh, your yes. hands. Oh, yes. That's right. Yeah. Mark Bowden told me that. I got to, can't forget them. Every time I go into video, I'm like, use your hands. Uh, yeah. Super, super important. Um, so do you have any tips for facilitators that are now making this, like this show is called first time facilitator, but I feel like mm -hmm. for the next sort of couple of weeks or months, who knows, it'll be first time virtual facilitator. Uh, <laughs> what are your some right. tips or advice for someone that's just starting out? Like what, what, what can you tell them that might sort of encourage them, motivate them, help them learn, accelerate the process? Well, uh, okay. There are a few things that I tell everyone at the end of my training sessions that you've now received a lot of information. It's up to you what you do with that information. Uh, but there are some recommendations. One is that um, practice a ton. And, and that's, I referred earlier to the curiosity of just clicking through every menu going through to the settings and looking through every setting, what can I do with this? What's even possible? Just by going through the settings, you might spend, depending on the program, it might take you five minutes or it might take you an hour to click through all the settings. Um, if it's not like an, uh, like a, an ERP program, like which has a hundred thousand settings, it usually takes you no more than maybe 20 or 30 minutes to go through all the settings and then you'll learn a ton. What is this mm -hmm. designed for? what's possible, where do I see limitations? If anything is unclear, uh, contact the developers and ask, I would like to do this with your product, is it possible? And they can tell you whether or not it's possible. So that's one, just practice a ton. If you're using Zoom for the first time, it's good to have two computers so you can see uh, the, the facilitators or the host's view and the participant's view because they're mm. not gonna be the same. Mm. And the same applies now to everything. In face-to-face -face situations, everyone's experience is the same. We share the same physical space, the same air, the same uh, odors, everything, like the same chairs. You know, if the chair is hard, everyone's chair is hard. <laughs> and now we have no other shared context. Well, that's a different story. But the point is that 
you don't know what the participant is going through, so you have to simulate the participant's experience. So practicing with a pair is really useful. Uh, switch roles. One is the host, the other is the participant. Uh, try to follow your own instructions that you've written uh, from the participant's point of view and then see, all right, this screenshot doesn't make sense because I'm not seeing the same thing. Ah, I need to take a screenshot of this situation from the participant's oh, view. Yes. Right? Good so there point. are all these details of, of how was the experience different? And, and there's the nightmare of is the experience different on a Windows and a Mac machine? Or are you, on a mobile device? Do you work on a Mac or do you work on a PC? I work on a PC. Uh-huh. Uh, I've worked on both. Um, but uh, some years ago, I decided to, to move to PCs. Um, I think it was Windows 7. I, I, that was when the Windows interface evolved to a point where I thought, this is actually decent. Uh, I was a Mac fan for, for many years, and then I was like, this is actually pretty good. And I did a lot of gaming. I still do. Uh, and Windows is better for gaming. I didn't want to have two operating systems to play with, so I went all Windows. But mm-hmm. I'm proficient in both, uh, and I, I'm agnostic. I'm not a fan of anything. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love all technology. Uh, and I try to get acquainted with everything. But it, it's very challenging to do to produce instructions for people that work on every single platform. Yes. It means you need several sets of instructions. And those products keep evolving. The team's interface changes every three months. And so my instructions are, are out of date all the time. Uh, video instructions would be the best, but I don't have the time to update video instructions I all know. the time. So it's, it's hard, but the best thing you can do is to, to at least get to know, so to, you know what's going through the minds of the participants because you know what they're seeing on their end. So if you can assist them in real time, that's the best option. Mm. And then the next best thing is uh, doing instructions so that they can, uh, so they know beforehand, okay, this is what's going to happen and this is how this works. You can do all those visual aids. Mm. That's really, Uh, really good advice. Yes. And then um, don't go it alone. That's the most important thing. Don't go it alone. Um, Practicing with a colleague and then practicing with a familiar group, and then slowly expanding your comfort zone so that once your confidence rises, once you're more proficient with the tool, you try some more advanced methods. You try a longer session. Uh, You try to introduce new kinds of icebreakers. Uh, And then you can like expand your range slowly to the point where like, yeah, we would like to run a 100 person workshop, a full day workshop with teams. And you're like, sure, could be, can be done, no problem. That, it's going to cost a lot of money, that, yeah. but it can be done. <laughs> that is like black belt, black belt virtual facilitation. Um, I love that idea about sort of buddying up and getting a group. We did the first go live before you go live session this morning. I just got a bunch of people, right. five or six of us all around the world. How was it? Amazing. We needed more time. We were just sort of geeking out on everything. We just took turns uh, in the co-host chair. And we're getting right. feedback on things like, you know, even just audio, what you look like, where you're looking at into the camera putting out polls, sharing results, breakout rooms, all of it. It was awesome. It was really good. All recorded. So we can all look at that video and reflect on, you know, what are we doing? And I'm guessing there was a lot of fooling around and laughing. Yes. Yeah. Because 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 (laughs) one of the participants, I won't say any names, but she shared her screen and then started talking about what was on the screen. And we're like, we can't see it. We can't see (laughs) it. So like, right. Instruction. (laughs) Before you, when you share your screen, just confirm, use the chat or hand, raise hands to confirm that everyone can see what you see. Cause she was telling a great story, but we're like, we can't see the images. So the first thing I'm I sorry said, to interrupt you, but I have no idea what you're sharing. <laughs> yeah, I know, but like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> no. It was a great story. Unfortunately, we just couldn't see what was going on. It was a lot of right. fun. And I think the, how I framed that was like, guys, this is Zoom. We can't break anything. Just if anything fails, exactly. just refresh, get back in. You'd rather fail now than in front of your client. So um, that's really great advice. Jonas, if people would like to connect with you and just find out just everything that you do, and I know you're really busy at the moment, but surely you'd love a few more phone calls and texts and SOSs <laughs> from around the world. Uh, where can we send Fortunately, <laughs> I have colleagues who can help me with that. <laughs> that's awesome. What's the best contact for you? All right. So... Um, you can uh, reach us at, uh, by email, it's easy, service at greatpeople.fi. Um, so that's grape, 
grapes as in wine grapes. <laughs> yes, yeah, not because, yeah, you hear grape, you think, oh, great people, which I love. I love that it has that. Great people, yeah, that's what yep. most people hear. It's like, I agree, but the name is actually grape people. <laughs> yeah, with a P, great with a P. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, put a link to your LinkedIn profile as well. Um, For sure. And I'd gonna, love to connect. You've got, a, you've got a Facebook group as well, don't you? Or you're part of the Finnish, your Facebook group's yes. been going nuts too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm part of the uh, Finnish Association of Facilitators, uh, and there's a Facebook group for that. Um, about two years back, I, I realized that maybe there should be a separate group for virtual facilitation because it's such an obscure topic. Certainly not everyone is interested in that, right? <laughs> so I created this group, and uh, it was kind of dormant for a couple of years. We had maybe two, 300 members, but there wasn't a lot of conversation. And then it took off um, at, at the beginning of this year. Uh, I invited a lot of people from the Association of Facilitators there. And now it's grown in one week to 2,000 plus members. <laughs> and I don't know where it's going to stop. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. <laughs> wow. And this is your moment. You know, everyone's got their, their spot in the, in the sunshine. This is your time. So... I know it's busy, yeah. but I think it's wonderful. And I think, you know, you've done just talking about your career history, everything you've done, you deserve to be where you are today. And um, it's, we're very grateful. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with all of us. It's great to be able to help at this scale. It's something I've hoped for my entire life. And now that it, it, the, the opportunity is here, I'm not sure how to take it. So yeah. it's going to be adjusting for some time more. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to accept the responsibility of, of helping a lot of people and we'll see what we can do there. Amazing, Ernest. Thanks so much. Thanks.